Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. In our last session we were looking at chapter 6 of Hebrews and we finished on this verse. This is Hebrews 6 verse 12. The writer says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what had been promised. The writer is encouraging us, that's you and me, as well as the Hebrews, to imitate faithful saints of old. And in our passage that we're going to look at in this session, he gives us a prime example, and that's Abraham. So turn in your Bible with me. Hebrews 6, we're going to read on from verse 13. Hebrews 6, verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we have here a passage that is seeking to reassure us of the certainty of the hope that we have in you. Lord, as we look at this passage together, Please encourage our hearts that we would follow you, you more closely and be faithful to you all our days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have the writer to the Hebrews who's uh, started off by telling us that God has spoken. And then he's told us that we need to pay special attention to what God has said. And then we learn that Jesus has been tempted in every way like uh, like we are. So he is able to help us. And then in our last uh, session, we were warned about the possibility of falling away. And we're encouraged to go on uh, seeking God all our lives. And whatever our particular viewpoint is, on whether you can become a Christian and lose your salvation or not, the end result is the same for whichever our view is. The end result is that we need to keep on being faithful to the Lord. And that last verse in verse 12 that I read before we started today, uh, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Here's a great way for us to be encouraged in our faith to go on and on with God, whatever the circumstances may be. And we can look back at the example of great people like Abraham and by following his example, so we too can be faithful until we inherit the promise. And by looking at Abraham's example, we can avoid being lazy. We can avoid falling away. Now, how familiar are you with the story of Abraham? We all know about him, of course. Um, uh, he was the, the father of the whole uh, nation of the children of Israel uh, because Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, who was also known as Israel. Uh, but Abraham was the one to whom God made the promise that, well, he took him outside and said, look at the stars in the sky. And this was in the days before light pollution, before electricity. 
Uh, the skies in those days would have, would have looked amazing, just as they do even today, when we can get away from all the light pollution that's around. And God promised that his descendants would be greater than the, the stars in the night sky. Let's just have a look at the story of Abraham. If we turn back to Genesis and chapter 12 to start with, Here we've got the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So there's a great promise that God makes very early in Abraham's uh, story when God calls him and gets him to leave his country and his people to go to the land that he was showing him. We can flick on a couple of chapters. Uh, we have the story in between of Abraham and Lot where Lot chooses to go one way and Abraham goes the other way so that there's no conflict between them. And then we have the story of uh, Lot being captured and Abraham going and rescuing his, his, uh, uh, his, his uh, brother, Lot. And uh, in that story, we have the story of Melchizedek, which we'll look at in due course. But then in chapter 15, it, God confirms his promise this is where it says he took him outside and said look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them then he said to him so shall your offspring be Abraham believed the Lord and he credited credited it to him as righteousness and if we look at verse 18 in the same chapter Genesis 15 verse 18 on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, with Abraham, and said to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites and Jebusites. God repeats this promise. He makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says, this is my promise to you. And if you go on a bit further, in chapter 17 and verse 7, God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. The whole of the story of Abraham is uh, written throughout it, is this amazing promise that God made to this one man, that he would bless him. And although Abraham had his moments uh, for instance, when uh, he's sad that he doesn't have a son and heir and God says, well, you will. And then his wife, Sarah, says, well, you take my servant and have a child by her. Maybe that's what God wants to do. So he took matters into his own hands and uh, thought that maybe that was the way God was going to bless him. But in spite of those failings. God still made it happen. Sarah had a son and through that son, uh, God's blessing was shown. And here in Hebrews, the writer to Hebrews is saying, do you know, if you look at the life of Abraham, you will see God's promises in action. You'll see the certainty of them and you too will be encouraged to go on with God. And inherit the promise that uh, he has made for you. And like he was patient, you're going to need to be patient too. Well, I've got 
very quick pause on the passage today three really simple questions so uh, and I thought it might not be a bad idea to actually keep you uh, reminded of what passage we're actually studying I've not done that before but I hope that'll be helpful to you we're just looking at these verses from 13 to 20 and our first question here is quite simple what are the two unchangeable things in verse 18 it says God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. What are those two unchangeable things? Second question, for whom is this important? Third question, exactly where is our anchor? read the passage see if you can get the answers to these questions it shouldn't take you too long today and when you're ready press play again and I'll share some further thoughts with you see you in a moment welcome back so let's think a little bit more deeply into this passage two unchangeable things says the writer to the Hebrews what are they? They could both be summed up as one thing, and that is God himself. Because the first unchangeable thing is the promise that God has made. To Abraham, it was the promise that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. There are promises that God has made to us. That if we trust him, if we're faithful to him, uh, we will inherit the riches that Christ has purchased for us on the cross. And the promise is sure because it's God who has made it. And God himself can't lie. As this passage says, uh, it's, it's impossible for God to lie. So if God has said something, it is going to happen. Actually, throughout the Bible, we're encouraged that uh, if we read a word of prophecy, the test of whether that prophecy is from God is simply whether it comes true or not. And if prophecy does not come true, it has not come from God. Why? God cannot lie. And here, God has made a promise to Abraham. He's made promises to us. God cannot lie. Those promises are certain and they are sure. So that's one. That's quite easy. What's the second one? It talks about an oath. And this is where it, it comes in verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. The idea of an oath, it, it almost seems a bit old fashioned these days, but there are still people who will do this. They'll, they'll say something to you and if they think you're in any doubt, they will say, I swear by, and they will use something that's either greater than them or something that's more important to them. Uh, I've heard people swearing on the lives of their own children, which makes me feel very uncomfortable, I have to say. Uh, but in, in this context, there was nobody that God could refer to and say, I swear by, because there's no one greater. So what does God do? He says, I swear by myself. Can you think of instances in the Bible where God says, as surely as I live, I will. Now, we have the promise of God made certain. Why? Because he has spoken it and because it's vested in his character that he cannot speak an untruth. He cannot fail to fulfill his promises. His word and his being are two unchangeable things. And these are the things 
but make it certain for us that what God has said he will uh, bring to pass. A rabbi, Rabbi Eleazar, said this, Lord of the world, if thou hadst sworn by heaven or by earth, I would have been able to say, as heaven and earth pass away, so also thine oath shall pass away. But now thou hast sworn by thy great name, by thyself, as thy great name lives and abides eternally, so shall thine oath continue secure in all eternity. It's absolutely certain because God's promise is vested in him and he cannot lie. That's the certainty of the promise. But for whom is this important? That was the second question I asked you to to consider. Well, it's quite clear, isn't it? I hope that this is what you found. It says uh, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. The writer is obviously writing to the Hebrews, but this is God's word to us. We are able to learn from this. This is important because it's for us and for our encouragement. And what the writer is saying is look back at the great faithful people to whom God made promises and for whom he fulfilled those promises and take heart. Don't give up. As we were looking in verse 12, don't be lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. We need to continue in faith and in patience because that way, learning from the examples of the past, we can be given certainty of hope now, today, in our lives. Third question. Where exactly is our anchor? Well, it's important to understand, first of all, that there is an anchor. You see, a lot of people think that it's their truth that matters, that they're living for number one and that that actually they're in their own little bubble. And that's what's important. But as Christians, we believe that what's important is that we have a, an external anchor. But no matter where we may be in life, no matter what trials we may be facing, we are holding on to one who is unchangeable. And therefore, we have a reference point outside ourselves so that we're not misled and, and uh, become selfish and self-centered and think that we're the only ones who exist. But where is that anchor? Well, it says here, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Whenever I think of an anchor, I think of a boat. And uh, I've been on uh, lots of boats, used to go out on, on small fishing boats from Deal. Uh, Deal Beach uh, many years ago and I remember dropping anchor lots of times and what happens is the anchor goes down and it holds on to the seabed to hold the boat in one position so that it doesn't drift. It may drift a little bit around the anchor but it won't go off um, uh, and drift away and I always think of an anchor going down but here we've got a picture of an anchor going up to heaven. That Jesus, when he ascended and went back to his father, he took with him the anchor for us and he's taken it right into the holiest place of all. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You know, what actually holds an anchor or what holds a boat 
uh, I've always assumed that the anchor just drops down to the seabed and it hooks around something and that's what holds it in place. That's not the case. In fact, uh, I've got a little diagram which I'll uh, put up to you when I can find my mouse. Here it is. Uh, what you find is that the anchor chain or the anchor cable has to be several times the length of the boat plus the depth of the water that it's in. And the anchor holds onto the seabed even if it's only sand but then the cable lies along the seabed and then it comes up to where the boat is. And if the, the wind or the tide tries to carry the boat away, it may lift a little bit more of the chain, but the anchor stays firmly bedded in the sand or on the rocks or wherever it is. And that's why, no matter how well an anchor is holding, uh, when they want to lift the anchor from the seabed, they will just move the boat forward, taking up the cable as they go up to the point where the boat is over the anchor and the anchor will come straight up. Now, why do I show you that little illustration? Quite simply because there's another little uh, clue here, a nautical term. When it talks about uh, we have Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. This is alluding to something that used to happen. It doesn't happen these days, or at least uh, not, not that I'm aware of. But you see, we think of a boat of, as having a rudder at the stern, and we can either turn it with a tiller or we can turn it with the ship's wheel, and we can make the boat go where we want it to go. Rudders like that didn't come in until at least 100 AD, and they developed over a period of time from there. So when the writers of the Hebrews were writing, the boats did not have rudders at the back. They would have had a, a steering oar, a blade, over one side or the other of the boat, and they would turn that to try and make the boat steer. That meant that in rough weather, it was very difficult for the boat to steer itself into a harbour. And they would have a small boat on board, which they would let down. And this boat was called the Forerunner. The Forerunner would take the ship's anchor. And as they rowed into the harbour, the, the people on the boat would lay out more and more of the, the rope holding the anchor. But the Forerunner would go right into the harbour. And wherever that boat was going to moor up, they would drop the anchor there. And then, of course, the anchor would hold firm in the harbour. There would just be a long cable running out to where the boat was. And then the boat would be able to winch its way along the cable towards the anchor and it was able to get safely into the harbour. Now, isn't that a lovely picture of what Jesus has done? He's taken an anchor for us. He's placed it right in the Holy of Holies, right into God's very presence. And if we are patient and faithful and keep inching our way along, uh, the promise is that the anchor is secure. It will not move and we will inherit what God has promised. Our anchor is in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Isn't that a great promise? And a great picture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the more we look at your word, the more we realise the provisions that you have made to ensure that we end up safe in the harbour that you have prepared for us in heaven. Oh, Father, we thank you for what we've learned today about Jesus and how he is the forerunner who has gone to make things ready for us. Lord, may we learn from those in the past who have been faithful and have inherited the promises. May we too be faithful to death and inherit the promises that you have for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that's been a blessing to you. I'll look forward to seeing you for our next session. In the meantime, have a great week.